The Galaxy S7 isn't perfect, but it's as close to perfection as I've ever seen in a phone. At 5.5 inches, the S7 Edge is, I think, the Goldilocks in terms of size for those who love Samsung's big and beautiful Super AMOLED displays, but perhaps find the 5.7 inch Galaxy Note series a bit too big for them, or the standard 5.1 inch S7 a little bit too small. But screen size is one thing, but it doesn't tell you the whole story about the size of a phone. Take the iPhone 6 S Plus, for example, which directly competes with the S7 Edge. It has the same 5.5 inch display size, but the Edge is seven millimeters shorter and five millimeters narrower. Now, it doesn't sound like an awful lot but when you hold them both together in your hand the edge looks and feels so much smaller and more compact in your hand than the iPhone. The curved glass on the front and the back of the phone give the S7 a really uniquely futuristic sort of aesthetic and look about it but as premium and perhaps even as precious as it looks I'm not sure I'm completely sold on the edge curved screen. I don't think it's all it's cracked up to be. I say cracked. Actually the display is really really strong and resilient to uh, scratches and dents it uses Gorilla Glass 4. But what isn't so durable is actually the metal band, metal body around the outside of the device which like the S6 before it seems to pick up scratches and dents really easily. Now I'm someone who doesn't actually use a case on their phones. I I know I probably should, uh, but it seems a shame to cover up such a beautiful device with a cheap plastic shell. Uh, but because I don't use a case, I'm usually very careful with my phones because I know they're not protected. But unfortunately, I had a little accident with the S7 Edge the other day when uh, it slipped out of my pocket when I was uh, uh, putting my jeans in my locker at the gym. But it did manage to uh, graze, sort of scratch the bottom uh, metal corner of it, which is obviously a huge shame given how premium and how uh, uh, stylish the whole thing looks. So I think I will be using a case in the future, but it is an improvement over the S6 Edge if you've ever used one of those, but this S7 Edge I still find a bit uncomfortable to hold. It's extremely narrow side edges means uh, perhaps if you're out and about or you're using, uh, you're taking photos with it, I find I can't get the same sort of purchase, the same grip on it that I could with the S6 or even the standard S7. And so um, it's just a bit precarious, as I say. I, I feel like I'm gonna, it's gonna fall out of my hand more easily. And not, not only is it sort of a bit less uh, secure in my hand when I'm holding it, but when I'm using it for long periods of time, I find, uh, as I say, the narrow edges sort of dig into your hand a little bit. It's a minor issue, it's a first world problem, of course. But compared to the standard S7, which is uh, well, a lot of people aren't sure whether they'll go for that or the S7, uh, more often than not, I'm finding that as soon as I take it out of my pocket, I'm sort of really grasping onto it for grip. So I definitely would recommend a case for it, which obviously is a shame because it's such a beautiful device, but uh, for security and to make sure you don't drop it, and also to get some better grip on it because of its lack of bezels, uh, I would probably recommend getting a case. But actually the bigger issue is because it's got such narrow bezels and uh, the display curves in towards your palm, uh, quite a lot of the time I'm, as I'm typing on the virtual keyboard, uh, or perhaps tapping on an icon, the phone doesn't register it. But if I'm perhaps uh, tapping maybe Q or A or P, one of the letters on the sides of the keyboard, often it just won't register it, even if I keep tapping. And that's because I think my palm is actually coming into contact with the screen. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter which, ha which hand I use it in. Uh, and therefore it's not registering any input. So it's just a little bit frustrating when I'm trying to type a message and it just stops responding and I think perhaps Touch Wiz is frozen, but actually better, more often than not Touch Wiz is fine on here. It is in fact just my palm uh, getting into contact with it. I don't know how particularly fat hands or anything or uh, anything like that, I'm not Donald Trump. I should know that small hands, isn't it? I know how to hold a phone. I haven't had any problems in the past, but uh, too often, too often it, be, it has become frustrating. It just doesn't register it. Um, as I'm pressing it. I've tried a couple of different keyboards, it's all the same. I've even, even tried turning off the edge panels thinking that that might reduce uh, how much touch Wiz is looking for contact with the side, you know, to slide in the edge panel. But it doesn't make a difference, unfortunately. So it's something you do get used to and you perhaps just have to rearrange your grip a little bit. But it's just a bit of an annoyance, really. Now, of course, Samsung is trying to add some function to the edge's form uh, with edge panels, which you can swipe in to show app shortcuts, news updates, Twitter feeds. It's not something I personally use or really find that useful, uh, but the option is there if you want it, or if not, you can just turn it off. The choice is yours. But regardless of the curve, the S7 Edge is still a fantastic looking device. Overall, the design is basically the same with the glass front and back metal body and rounded corners. We've got the same three and a half millimeter jack, micro USB port, not a USB type C, unfortunately, and the same single speaker. Unfortunately, there's bad news for those who enjoyed controlling their TVs with the Galaxy S6's built-in IR emitter, as Samsung has unfortunately taken it off on both the new S7 phones. Now, since the S7 is a bit thicker than its predecessor, the camera lens doesn't protrude quite as much out of the back of the phone, but it's still not flush, so it may be worth getting a case to protect the lens anyway. 
The home button on the front is flanked by the usual recent apps and return capacitive buttons and still doubles as a very effective fingerprint reader. It doesn't seem to be any faster than one on the S6, but it's still just as good, very reliable, and I think gives the Touch ID on iPhones a run for its money. I also think the new Onyx black color is actually really stylish. It's not quite as nice as the deep blue, I don't think, on the S6. Obviously, it's subjective, it's everyone's opinion, but uh, if you're not a fan of the Onyx black, you can also get the Edge model in silver or gold. But ignoring the curved edges, the S7's Super AMOLED Quad HD display is absolutely breathtaking and quite possibly the best display on any smartphone. At 534 pixels per inch, it's ridiculously sharp, although of course not quite as sharp as the standard S7, which is only 5.1 inch in terms of screen size, but has the same resolution. But the only time you might notice that difference is if you're using the Gear VR headset, which is where uh, pixel density becomes a bit more important. But it's the screen's inky blacks and rich whites and vibrant colors that don't just pop and look great, but it's actually also a very technically accurate display in terms of things like color reproduction, gamma, and contrast ratios with DisplayMate, uh, the website describing as having the best smartphone display on the market. It's also 24% brighter than last year's S6, which makes it much more usable in bright conditions, as well as making everything just pop more and uh, look even more vibrant. But you may be wondering, how does this big, brilliant display affect the battery life? Well, if you haven't seen my S6 versus S7, versus S7 Edge battery life comparison. I do recommend you go and check that out at the end of this video. You can find it in one of those card things uh, floating about. But spoiler alert, the S7 Edge lasted over twice as long as last year's Galaxy S6, despite having a bigger, brighter screen. On average, it also lasted about 10% longer than its smaller brother, the S7. This is in part down to the uh, very efficient Exynos 8890 processor, which is in here, and of course the latest Android 6 Marshmallow software. But the biggest reason is the Edge has a seriously big 3,600 milliamp hour battery inside. And as a former S6 owner, the jump to this S7 Edge is huge in terms of battery life. Without pushing it too hard uh, and using the power saving mode and having brightness at around 50%, I was able to get almost two full days out of the Edge, uh, which uh, if battery life is a big deciding factor for you if you're looking to buy a new phone, you can't go wrong with this. Now let's talk performance. Inside this S7 Edge, we have the Exynos 8890 processor, that's optical. And we also have four gigabytes of RAM and 32 gigabytes of built-in storage. Now, obviously being Exynos, this is gonna be the UK or European model. Uh, you, in some territories, including the US, you can get the Snapdragon 820 processor instead. In some benchmarks, we're seeing the uh, Snapdragon beat the Exynos, but if you look at my S6 versus S7 speed comparison, you'll see that the, there's a huge difference in benchmark performance, but when it comes down to real world things like uh, app launching speeds and boot times, there isn't a big difference between them. So even if the 820 is perhaps 10% faster in benchmarks, you're not gonna see that translate into any appreciable real world difference. And that's really for two reasons. Not only is there diminishing returns these days with uh, processors and graphics cards already being so powerful, but the user experience and how fast everything feels from swiping around the home screens and opening apps is really down to the software. Uh, in this case, Android 6 and of course, Samsung's Touch Wiz skin. So whether you have the Snapdragon or the Exynos model of the new S7 Edge, both are veritable beasts in terms of performance. And with the extra gigabyte of RAM in this year's S7 phones, even Samsung's Touch Wiz software that perhaps in the past has felt a little bit bogged down, perhaps a bit sluggish, feels faster than ever. It's still not quite perfect. Every now and then there's a little hiccup or a pause, uh, but coming from the S6, everything feels a lot faster and more responsive. And as always, you can just add a third-party launcher like Google Now or perhaps Nova uh, on top of uh, TouchWiz if you prefer. But either way, the S7 Edge is extremely fast and as you'd expect, has no issues whatsoever playing the latest, most intense uh, games available on the Google Play Store. Now, as with any phone launch, we expect to see sort of a better screen, maybe better battery life, slightly faster performance. But two features Samsung neglected to include with the S6 after having introduced it on the S5 is of course expandable storage and waterproofing, both of which make a return on both the S7 and the S7 Edge, which I'm pleased to say. The S7 is only available in 32 gigabytes, uh, but you can expand it up to 200 gigabytes by adding a micro SD card. Uh, not only can the camera save photos and videos to it, including 4K videos, which are now unlimited, you're not restricted to just five minutes anymore. So you could have hours of 4K footage potentially. The other good news is the S7 is now IP68 dust and waterproof, which means you can use it in the bath if you want to, or uh, you know the shower, whatever you want to do while it's raining outside, as long as you don't exceed uh, one meter depth and for 30 minutes. So of the three features we wanted to see return from the Galaxy S5, uh, we've got expandable storage and waterproofing, but alas, no removable battery, but uh, two out of three ain't bad.
But what the S7 Edge does support is the Gear VR. Uh, obviously, it's not exclusive to it. You can also use the S6, the S6 Edge Plus, and the uh, normal S7. But both the new S7 and S7 Edge have uh, obviously faster and have better cooling with uh, built-in heat pipes, uh, which is better for using the new headset. And of course, also, the better battery means you can use it for longer. Now let's talk about the camera. Samsung's replaced last year's 16 megapixel camera with a new 12 megapixel camera. The first thing I noticed is how much brighter and also how much more dynamic range there is in pictures and video taken on the S7. This is largely down to the new wider f1.7 aperture and also the larger 1.4 micrometer pixels on the image sensor. So the camera basically captures more light and therefore more detail, particularly in darker areas. So the S7 Edge really shines in low light conditions. For example, just look at this bar picture, uh, which is in a fairly dimly lit pub, but it appears really vibrant and bright and detailed. The S7 and the S7 Edge are also the first smartphones in the world to feature a dual pixel sensor, which is very similar technology to the ones, uh, to what's used in uh, DSLRs like the Canon 70D, and basically means you get almost instant autofocus because uh, the camera is using every single pixel to focus compared to just 0.78% of the pixels on the S6, which is less. So we've got a brighter, much more detailed, and much faster focusing camera on the new S7. But you're probably sick of my voice by now, I know I am. So I'll shut up for a minute and let you guys have a look at a few pictures and a few videos I've taken with the S7 Edge. So I'm sure you agree the S7's camera is pretty fantastic, whether you just want to point and shoot in auto mode or get a bit more uh, hands-on, a bit more advanced adjusting the ISO, the white balance and things like uh, the focus in pro mode. However, the downside of the new camera is not only is it 12 megapixels down from 16, which isn't a huge deal, but the sensors actually changed aspect ratio to 4x3 from 16x9. So if you wanted to take a 16x9 widescreen photo on the S6, you could use it at full 16 megapixels. On the new S7, you have to bring it down to 9.1, which is quite a drop. But considering the significantly better low light performance with the S7, and also the fact that it's got almost instant focusing, it's still an upgrade over the S6, even if it is lower resolution. In terms of the front camera, it's still five megapixels, which is the same as last year, uh, but it matches the f1.7 aperture of the rear camera, which is much wider, uh, so uh, the low light selfies are much better. And also it's got a much bigger, wider field of view uh, than the rear camera, so if you're trying to get like an Oscars style selfie with you and your mates, uh, the front camera is really good for that as well. You can find out more about the S7's camera in my upcoming S6 versus S7 camera shootout video, but overall I'm really impressed with the S7 Edge's uh, camera performance. Even though it's lower resolution, it is a noticeable step up from the S6. One of the other new features of the S7 is the always on display, which is shortened to AOD. It's actually pretty useful since you don't have to wake up your phone every time you wanna check the time, if you see if you've got any notifications, or you know check the date or something. And you can customize it too, whether you want a digital clock uh, or something more like a, a colored analog clock, this is on the S7 here, or if you want a calendar or perhaps even a full screen image, I actually quite like the star one, but I tend to stick with this, the uh, time and calendar. I think it's actually pretty useful. If you've already got an S7, you'll know that the always on display, about every minute or so, it will jump uh, around the phone, it will change its position, uh, which is actually a little bit distracting if it's like in your peripheral vision, but there's a good reason for it, it's to prevent screen burning on the AMOLED display. So um, if it's really distracting, you can turn off the uh, always on display, which you may also want to do to save battery life because Samsung claim it uses about 0.5% of your battery per hour, which I suppose over a day could grow to about 10%. Uh, so if uh, you're gonna ration your battery, if you're not that bothered about always on display, you can turn it off, but it is there if you want to, and you may save a bit of battery having it on because you don't have to keep waking up your phone just to check the time. Now in terms of sound quality, it actually depends on whether you have the Exynos or the Snapdragon version of the S7, as the digital audio converter, the DAC, uh, used is different for each device. For example, the Snapdragon 820, I think uses Qualcomm's WCD9335 DAC, 
uh, compared to Samsung's own uh, one in the Exynos. But without both phones in front of me, I can't tell you if there's much difference, if one is better than the other. But just because the DAC's different doesn't necessarily mean the audio quality is different because the amp may be the same. Uh, it's a bit too technical uh, to know unless I have both phones in front of me and I can do some proper side-by-side -side comparisons, which unfortunately I can't. I'm really impressed with the sound quality. I'm not a professional audiophile, I will uh, be honest with you, and I can't tell you if the Snapdragon one is better or worse, but um, all I can say is that it sounds great on the S7. Call quality on the S7 is excellent as well. I found people's voices to be warm and natural as opposed to the sort of robotic and tinny sound you can sometimes get on cheaper phones. So the big question, should you buy a Galaxy S7 Edge? Well, as you'd expect, the flagship specs are matched with a flagship price, although actually it's around 50 pounds or $50 cheaper than the equivalent model from last year, but it's still an awful lot of money at around 640 pounds or $800. Having said that, the iPhone 6S Plus is about 20 pounds cheaper, but that's for the entry level 16 gigabyte model, which I wouldn't recommend to anyone. So perhaps the Edge is actually slightly better value than the equivalent iPhone. I think the Galaxy S7 Edge is a great phone, but as nice as the curve looks and as futuristic as it makes it look and feel, I'm not really sure it adds anything in terms of functionality for me personally, and actually it's been more frustrating than anything else. But ignoring the curve, the 5.5 inch display I think is the sweet spot for loads of people in terms of size, and combined with the incredibly fast hardware, the outstanding battery life and the improved camera, and of course the return of the much loved micro SD card support and waterproofing, I think the S7 Edge is actually the best phone in the world right now. Although sometimes I can be tempted uh, by the normal S7 as it's quite a lot easier to hold, uh, the curve doesn't get in the way, and it is about 70 pounds cheaper. So should you buy the S7 Edge? Yes. Should you upgrade if you already own an S6 to the S7 Edge? Yes, especially if battery life is a big priority for you. Is it worth the high asking price? I think, yes, it's basically the ultimate phone. If you are happy to wait a couple of months, then you'll probably get a much better deal on it. But if you want the cutting edge and you want the absolute best uh, and you prefer Android to uh, iOS, then yes, it is worth the price. But of course, that's just my opinion. I'd be keen to hear what you guys think in the comments below. Let me know if you buy the S7 Edge uh, or actually prefer the S7. And also, are you sold on the curved display? Is it a bit of a gimmick? Or do you think it adds a bit, you know, adds some functionality to it and does look pretty cool? Let me know, as I say, in the comments below. So I hope you found this video helpful. You can find links uh, to the S7 Edge in the description below if you want to find out more or buy one. Uh, and if you enjoyed my video, please do like and subscribe. I apologize it's been quite long, but there's a lot to talk about with the Edge, I'm sure you'll agree. But so uh, thank you very much for watching. Please do like and subscribe, and I'll see you again right here on the Tech Chat.